I've been losing everything today. <laughs> like I lost my notes or sir, and I was like, well, I hope they're at the pulpit. They are. That's good. That's why I'm laughing. Let you in on my private joke. All right. That's kind of funny, but this, uh, the subject matter for tonight is, is not funny. Um, I'm going to be preaching a sermon on a documentary I saw recently. It's called Let Us Pray. And it's, that's spelled P-R-E-Y. Like, like pray, like a predator would prey on, on people. And, um, you know, after watching this, uh, I saw a lot of problems with it. But there's also stuff that, that is worth mentioning anyways, I think, in general, um, with, with problems that do exist in many churches and in IFB churches and whatever. And um, I'm going to try my best to sort of cover just to do a good job of covering in, in totality. I didn't take notes or anything while I was watching this. I, I, it's just like a few episodes or something. I watched the whole thing. And it's very similar to other documentaries that come out. There's, there's a lot of, um, I, don't, I don't know how many, I don't say a lot, but there's definitely some people who have put out uh, documentaries or, or you know, videos and stuff to try to uh, basically bash IFB churches specifically, and this one is definitely targeting IFB, like that is the focus of this, and you know, if you haven't seen it, that's fine, it, it, it doesn't matter what, what happened, essentially the, the overview is, it revol the story revolves around three women who had been abused by predators in their church, in, in their respective churches, whatever IFB churches they were going to, okay? And um, obviously there is no defense for that whatsoever. It's wicked, it's wrong. Um, but one of the things that they talk about is the sweeping under the rug aspect of it, which is a huge problem for any church that does try to do that. Okay, but right off the bat, you know, when, when people put out things against independent fundamental Baptists, there's a reason why we're, independent because this isn't a denomination ifb is not inherently its own denomination there is no denomination structure for independent churches that's why the first word is independent now there are similarities amongst independent fundamental baptists because I think labels are a good thing, generally speaking. You want to get an idea of what churches teach and what they stand for? I'm all for it. I like that Pentecostals use the word Pentecostal to describe their type of a church. I like the fact that Reformed churches or Presbyterian churches or Lutheran churches or whatever are using those labels and those names to identify their church, which is why we are independent fundamental Baptists because we're trying to identify who we are, but one of the things, again, the most important part is that like those other denominations I mentioned are like formal denominations, and they have hierarchies, and they have structures, and they have certain creeds and codes that you have to abide by in order to be part, a member of their denomination, and it literally is a membership that you are part of an overall, a larger organization and structure. We do not. So, while there are many similarities amongst IFB churches, there's also a lot of differences too. And maybe to an outside person or someone, especially like an unbeliever, they're not gonna see any difference, okay? But once you start checking out different churches, you'll definitely see some differences and significant differences too, you know? Um, um, amongst the way things are taught, even just like this morning, what I was teaching about with our view on the preservation of God's word in the King James Bible. I mean, there's IFB, plenty of IFB churches that w will probably call me a heretic over what I taught. <laughs> I'm not kidding, right? I mean, it's, that's, there's some people that are extreme, like Ruckmanite position where, where I mean, I'm like blaspheming the Lord or something by, by teaching what I consider to be a reasonable approach to understanding the preservation of God's word. And even though, um, you know, I still believe that the, the KJV is, is inerrant and I believe it's, it's God's word, it's perfectly preserved and it's just on the same exact level as the Hebrew and Greek, uh, whatever. But I, that's, sorry, that's still on my mind a little bit from this morning. But 
various doctrines, various things. People believe all kinds of different things. There's independent fundamental Baptists that I would not want to ever go to attend, just in general. So trying to broad brush and just sort of paint this picture of all independent fundamental Baptists, I have an issue with that as an independent fundamental Baptist. Imagine that. Um, and the other thing that, that happened in this is they were playing a lot of clips from people who were not the perpetrators of the crimes that were committed. The biggest one was Jack Hiles. So there were many, 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 many clips of Dr. Jack Hiles that were played in this. And a lot of them were just the same clips kind of over and over and over again. They kept on playing the same stuff because they were just looking for the most extreme content that they could find to just continue like throwing that out at people. And I get it, like when people say things, it's, you, you should always say what you mean and mean what you say, but context does matter, right? I mean, especially in a sermon, you're teaching on things, like there's many times you really ought to get the whole context of what's being said before you just snip one piece out and throw it out for every, you know, to, as to be like, oh, can you believe he said this or something? It's like, well, listen to the whole thing. And we get our fair share of that anyways, where people just want to focus on, on one small clip. And the problem is that there's like, they're, they're talking about all these predators, they're talking about this abuse, they're talking about all these things, but then they're playing clips from people who've never had charges brought against them. Like, the, and, and, look, and look, I'm not a Dr. Jack Howells expert by any means, okay? I've listened to some of his preaching, but I don't know him that well. But, I mean, has the guy ever been even char? I, like, not that a charge means you're guilty, but has he ever been charged with any type of abuse? To my knowledge, the only thing that's happened is there has been rumors about infidelity with another church worker or something. But even that, I don't think that's ever been like confirmed or verified or anything like that. I think it's never passed the point of gossip to my understanding about that situation, okay? Maybe I'm wrong about that. I don't know. Now, he has some children who have been very wicked in their adult life. And, and that is wrong, okay? And I, again, I don't know all of the details about that, but this isn't about those specific people. What, what I don't like is that they're using teachings from some people and then talking about abuse in completely different churches. Now, Jack Scott was a guy that took over for Jack Hiles. That guy's a pervert. Yes. He's a predator. He's a false prophet. He deserves to be outed and exposed and the full penalty of the law and probably beyond what our law would do, he deserves more, okay? And the guy's wicked. And, and look, we, we want no association with him as much as anyone else. But one of the things you have to realize, if, if we're just going to talk about abuse within churches, it happens across all denominations. I mean, you could just as well, might as well just, just do a documentary then against all Christianity or all religion for that matter, or even public schools for that matter, because abuse takes place in all of those places. When you have people that are in positions of power, they abuse those positions of power. You have predators that creep into places and just to get access to children and will abuse people because they're sick, because they're perverted, because they're, they're twisted and they're reprobate and that's who they are. So they're gonna take advantage of that in all places. And I mean, if you're gonna find someone who's a little bit more indicative of like this type of abuse, what, you take what about the Catholic Church? <laughs> but like I said, it's still, it's amongst, it's, it's, it's across the board. You're gonna find instances right? So using that against the IFB, but here's what they do in my, in my estimation is they're also tying together the, the teachings on gender roles and modest dress, specifically for women, of course, it really doesn't talk about the men so much, but it's, it's, it's on the women, and they, they kind of make the point, and again, this is, I didn't take notes, I didn't write down any quotes or anything, but my estimation, my after, after watching it was, it seemed like they were trying to associate this teaching with like a, a, a grooming or a, a um, predisposing women to be abused, right? As, as if these doctrines are making it more, like more easy for women to be abused and to not speak up about it. So 
their attack on the IFB is trying to attack particular doctrines of saying that, see, this is what it produces. And I'll take issue with that as well, right? Because the doctrine of the Bible and the things that are clearly taught in Scripture are good. Amen. Evil people do evil things. It's not the doctrine's fault. Now, another reason why we're independent, though, is because some IFB churches go crazy on some things <laughs> and teach things that are not scriptural and not biblical, and people will go over the top. It happens. And we can't control that. And we don't want to control that for them because they're independent, just as much as we're independent, right? So you really got to be able to get that, uh, get that clear. I mean, they even use at the very first episode a clip of Pastor Anderson in their, in their teaching. Just it, as they're showing different people saying things, it's one clip. But he's never had even any allegations of, of abuse or wrongdoing or anything like that, let alone being convicted or, or, or anything of the sort. Their church is, is clean. There's, there's, there hasn't been any, any issue like that, yet they put it in there anyways. And it's kind of like, really? You're going to put that in there? I mean, our church is clean. Our church believes similar doctrines to what they were talking about. We don't have a predators in here. We don't have abusers. You know, we don't, we don't have that stuff going on here. And there's plenty of other, many other, probably the vast majority of churches that say the same exact thing. So what I want to do is just cover these different things because, like I said, there's still some, there's definitely truth in there because the women who got, who got abused were abused, and they got abused by wicked men. And that ought to stop, and I, and, and I think all churches need to learn from every time there's abuse in church on how to prevent that from ever happening to begin with. And it starts with, a, with biblical preaching and the word of God being coming across the pulpit on the whole counsel of God and not always just focusing on the positive and not just focusing on certain things and not worrying about offending people. Look, we need to preach the whole counsel of God because God's word tells us how to deal with these things. It tells us how to deal with predators. It tells us how to deal with the false prophets. It tells us what to look for. There's warnings in here. It tells us about these type of people so that we wouldn't be surprised, so that we shouldn't just let these wolves creep in unawares, so that you could have somebody who's keeping watch over the flock. And when someone creeps in, that is the wolf in sheep's clothing, it's also important that you have enough people that aren't the pastor that could still have their eyes open to these things. A well-educated church, people who are hearing the preaching of the word of God, people who are reading the Bible on their own, it's going to be a lot harder for a predator to get into the midst than it is for an ignorant church that shows up, they get their one verse, they get their 20 minutes of talking, they go home, and that's the extent of their spirituality. And you have all kinds of spectrum then there in between, right? But the number one thing is, look, we need to be aware of these things. We started off in 2 Peter chapter 2 because this is a passage that gives us so much of the attributes of these wicked people, like the perverts that abused these little girls. Because, and again, I don't know all the specific, I don't remember all the specifics, I don't know all the details, but these kids were like, some of them were preteens when they got abused. It's sick, it's disgusting, it's terrible. And it's a fact because, I mean, these people were convicted of their crimes. It wasn't, these aren't just like some false allegations. I mean, they even showed videotape of guys like confessing and admitting that they did it. So this, it's, this isn't a, a situation where did it really happen of question or doubt. It's not it at all. It definitely happened, right? And 2 Peter chapter 2, I, wanna, I just want to review this because this, I mean, of all things, I mean, what a, what a damage this does. What damage this did to those women, those ladies' lives? And what damage it does to a ministry and what damage it does to a church of God, especially a church that's, that's right, that's got the right gospel, that's doing a good work. For something like this to happen, I mean, that is so destructive. And we want to do our best to make sure something like that never happens. It never should be tolerated. It never should be brushed under the rug or tried to be hidden or put away somewhere. It needs to be exposed. It needs to be eradicated. And it needs to put the fear of God and the fear of man into any predators 
life into their mind into, into thinking about whether or not they're going to even attempt this at your church. A predator ought to be scared to death to be in this church and try to attempt to do anything to any of the people, especially the younger people in our church. Let's review some of uh, 2 Peter chapter 2 quickly. I know we read the whole passage, but um, the, the Bible is very clear and, and does a good job of continually warning about these people because they're so destructive and dangerous that God wants us to be aware and know these things. But the churches that aren't preaching out of 2 Peter chapter 2, that aren't preaching out of Jude, that aren't preaching these truths, you are, you are leaving your flock def defenseless. Some people don't even like think that these people really exist or it's just really not even in their minds. So many people are so trusting, especially in a church setting, as to just think, everybody's good. Who could ever possibly do this? And I'm going to trust whoever with my children and it should be fine. And I mean, one of the stories, the, the girl, I mean, it's real sad, but like she was going over to this guy's house to like babysit his kids or something. And it's just like, no, like, like don't let them do that. Don't let them, don't give these opportunities. Don't do it. It's not worth it. And, and I'll get into that a little later. There's, there's, there's all of always, there's rules and things we can put in place in our own lives to prevent such tragedies from ever happening. And unfortunately, too, these things happen in homes that are, there's some instability, oftentimes single parent homes where, where there's not as much oversight as would be ideal and, and, you know, maybe some, some other situations going on, uh, maybe poor uh, economic status and, and needing to do more things to, you know, to, to sort of make ends meet and dealing with those situations because they're, they're easier targets then for these predators. But with a good church, you know, hopefully we could still smell out, you know, snip out the rat if there is one, the wolf, and, and see through the disguise of the sheep's clothing so that we could try to not let that happen but again if parents are able to you know also have their rules i know i'm not going to let you go and do this i'm never going to going to send you to be alone with with someone hey they seem fine but don't send your little kids there and I, like i said i don't care who it is and i i would never i i, I don't even ex i don't expect anyone to ever trust even like me with your kids not that you can't trust me but like it's just not wise in general with anybody, right? So as much as I could say, I trust all of you in here. I have no reason not to trust you, right? But no offense, I'm never going to leave my children, young children, you know, alone with you. It's not going to happen. It's just one of the things that I, that I put in place because... Now, look, when in, in more public areas and there's people around, there's, a, you know, like it's... There's obviously different levels of rules that you, you create for your family, especially with different ages of kids and things like that as they get a little bit older and there's more people around and things are still uh, uh, very visible and, and uh, less opportunity for, for anything to be done that's not visible. Those are all go into place. But um, let's look at 2 Peter chapter 2 because I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. The Bible says there in verse number 1, but there are false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. So there's a warning about false prophets and they do these things privily, privately, secretly, right? They, they come in and try to, to introduce this, excuse me, secretly uh, because they don't want to be known because they know what they're doing is evil. And many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. So their ways is going to cause the right way, the way of truth, to be evil spoken of. And I would say IFB churches as a general is the way of truth. I mean, it's what I found. The reason why I even chose to ever become an independent fundamental Baptist was based on my own research and understanding of what people, you know, after I got saved, well, who's, who seems to be right? Who seems to be following the Lord? Right? Like that's, that was my determination. It's, it's a, Independent fundamental Baptist churches had were the most right on doctrine, on their approach to the Bible, on you know, on, on all these things. Good doctrine, it makes sense. So when you have this corruption and when you have these wicked people that that creep in unawares, 
and do wicked things and evil things, they cause the way of truth to be evil spoken of. So all the more reason to be, hey, let's pay attention, let's wake up, let's make sure that this doesn't happen. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you. They don't care about you, but they'll fake it. They'll make you think they do, but they don't care about you at all. They're just covetous. They care about money. They just care about what they could get from you. Whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. For if God spared not the angels that sin, but cast them down to hell, and deliver them in chains of darkness, be reserved unto judgment. And it goes on and on about, about Noah and Sodom and Gomorrah and all this stuff and about this judgment. He's saying, look, just as much as God knows how to judge and bring his wrath, he knows how to do that with these people as well. Because these false prophets are reprobate and they're just basically waiting for their own damnation at this point. Um, verse number 10, let's jump down to verse number 10. But chiefly them that walk after the flesh and the lust of uncleanness and despise government. Presumptuous are they, self-willed. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignities. Whereas angels, which are greater in power and might, bring not railing accusation against them before the Lord. But these, talking about these false prophets, these people who have crept in unawares, as natural brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed, speak evil of the things that they understand not and shall utterly perish in their own corruption. They are natural men. They don't understand the things of the Spirit of God. They don't know them, but they're like dumb animals, the Bible says, and they speak evil of the things they don't even understand. And shall receive the reward of unrighteousness as they that count it pleasure to riot in the daytime. Spots they are in blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you. Look at verse 14, having eyes full of adultery and that cannot cease from sin. This is the characteristic of the false prophet. Internally, these wolves, they, they've got eyes that can't cease from sin. You, whereas you're talking to people, you're trying to have wholesome conversations, you're trying to talk about the Lord, you're trying, you come to church, we're talking about the Bible, we're talking about just things in our life, we're talking about normal things, and you're fellowshipping, and then you've got the false prophet in their mind, their eyes are just full of adultery. They're looking on men's wives. They're looking on maybe kids. They're looking on, you know, they're, they're just, they're sick and twisted and perverted, and that's what's going on in their minds. And on the outside, yeah, everything, oh, they're putting on a smile, and they're, and they're able to repeat things and say things back to you. But this is the type of people you need to look out for, that they, they do exist. And the Bible's warning, look, they creep in, and they're going to do it privately, privately and they're going to do these things to cause damage and destruction. It's because they don't care about anyone else but themselves. The uh, Bible says here, then, after that, ver look at verse 14, having eyes full of adultery and they cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls. That's, I mean, if, if a child isn't an unstable soul, I don't know who is. Children are unstable because they still need to grow. They still need to be rooted down. They still need to learn. They still, you know, they need all this stuff. They're not as stable. They need to be taught up and they need to be protected as the unstable souls. Also, the people who have handicaps and some other things are also going to be some of the unstable souls, right? The people who are easier to victimize are the unstable souls. The people who aren't necessarily all sold out for God and everything else is another target where they're kind of in and out. And, you know, maybe we get some, I mean, think about the, the people that might come in. They're really poor. They're struggling. Maybe they've had a lot of sin in their life and stuff. And they've got no one to really speak up for them. And they're trying to do what's right, but then they're in these positions. You see the predators go after people like that too. Like, like, uh, like you know, you hear the stories about the, you know, a prostitute wants to get right with God and starts coming to church and stuff. And then the predator knows they have this type of a background. They know where they're coming from. And then they just target them and use that to abuse them. Kids that come in that have troubled past, maybe they, they even realize they've been abused in the past. In the past, perfect opportunity for the predator to go after them because they're looking for the unstable souls. They're looking for the people who have already had problems in the past to target. And it needs to stop and they need to be exposed immediately. And God forbid that anyone would try to shuffle these people around and hide that because I'm worried about what it might do to the church. How about you worry about what they might do to the next person? Amen. To the next unstable soul? I mean, if something like that were to happen, look, we're, you're just going to have to deal with it. 
the consequences of that happening under your watch, you just got to deal with it. No one's going to enjoy it. No one's going to like it, but you can't just brush it under the rug. You're going to have to deal with it appropriately. It says, in heart they have exercised with covetous practices, cursed children which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Bosor, love the wages of unrighteousness. Verse 17, these are wells without water, clouds that are carried with a tempest to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lusts of the flesh, through much wantonness, those that were clean escaped from them who live in error. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption, for of whom a man is overcome, of the same as he brought in bondage. Now, turn, if you would, to uh, Matthew chapter 7. We're just going to cover a couple of these passages. It's not, this, the sermon is not just all about identifying false prophets, but it is just, I want to show, like, look, the Bible does talk about this quite a bit. And, you know, if you're going to call out churches for anything, what I would like to do is call out the churches for not teaching on these things. Yeah. Right? We want to protect people from being abused in any church, then why don't you teach this stuff? Why don't you get heavy in the Bible? Why don't you get heavy into the doctrine? Why don't you read for more than just one verse? Because let's face it, not everybody reads their Bible cover to cover. And they're going to need this stuff. And they're, if they're only going to hear it in one place, it better be in your church. You could, you could, in, you could, tell people to your blue in the face that hey you need to read your bible you need to be reading it every day you need to make sure you're at least getting through it one time in a year you need to be doing these things but they're not all necessarily going to do it you know, the job of the pastor we're going to teach we're going to teach the whole counsel of god and not hold anything back and what's the best way to do that you're going to have to go through a lot of scripture <laughs> let's show this let's let, let's tie some things together that not maybe everyone's going to tie together let's point this stuff out and be like wow i didn't realize the bible actually talked about this that much Hey, let's look at the false prophet. Let's look at these people who are deceitful. Let's look at these predators and see what the characteristics are and see what should I be looking out for. Like the flatterer with their tongue. There's a big red flag. Someone that wants to just pour on all these compliments and tell you how sweet you are and butter you up. Watch out for those people. Don't, don't be, you know, get sucked into this praise. And you know what helps to not get sucked into the praise? Being humble. Because if you're not just thinking how great you are already and someone else is telling you how great you are, it's going to sound a little weird going like, I don't know why this person's telling me why I'm so great. Because you're humble, right? And, and I'm serious about that. Like, you, you know, you ought to feel kind of funny. If you, if you have the right level of humility, you should be able to just be like, man, I, I, like, why? Like, this is kind of weird. Because everyone knows what a normal compliment is. Everybody deals with that. Hope, mostly, at least. I don't know. Maybe there's some mean people out there that never want to compliment anyone. But, or the people, the person that's afraid of ever being seen as a flatterer. <laughs> like, I don't want to be a flatterer. Like, look, you can compliment people. It's fine. But, you, you, you know, it, it's usually pretty obvious when people are going over the top. When it's all the time, every day, you just keep on getting, you know, like, look, that's a red flag. And there's plenty of similar red flags that the Bible teaches us about and instructs us about. When it comes to false prophets, Jesus tells us in Matthew 7, Look at verse number 15, which so many times, so frequently, this passage is misapplied to just any believer. But it's not any believer. He's literally, Jesus says in verse 15, beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. It's describing the person who looks good on the outside and inwardly they're wicked. They want to destroy and devour and eat up the sheep. Ye shall know them by their fruit. Who are you going to know? The false prophets that he just talked about the verse earlier. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? And look at the contrast here. Something that's really good for you, like fruit, versus like thorns that's going to hurt you and damage you. I mean, it's just like the, 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 the life-giving stuff and the death-bringing stuff side by side. Why? Because the good prophet is going to bring forth life and the good things out of God's word and, 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 and literally you'll be leading souls to Christ and things like that, whereas the false prophet, they're twice dead. Plucked up by the root. They, they bear thorns. They're, they're, they are. Now, look, outwardly, they're going to be wearing the sheep's clothing. So they're going to try to look like, hey, look at me. I'm doing good. Judas Iscariot did a good job of fooling. That wolf in sheep's clothing 
pass himself off as a disciple of Jesus Christ. He talked the talk. He was out with them. But you know what? He was, if he was making any converts, his converts were twofold the child of hell as he was. Because he's a son of perdition. Okay, and he's not, he's not bringing anyone to Christ regardless of what anyone says. Jesus is telling us right here that you're going to know the false prophet by their fruits. Verse 17, he goes on to explain, even so every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth evil, good fruit. Excuse me. Corrupt tree can't bring forth good fruit. It just can't happen. You can't bring forth good reproduction. The fruit is, right? The fruit of a tree, it's the tree reproducing. It contains the seed of, the, of that tree to be able to bring forth another tree. Imagine that. That's from the fruit. So, applying this to a prophet, what is that prophet reproducing? Well, if they're a tree and they're reproducing, they're only going to be able to bring forth, if they're a bad tree, then they can only bring forth bad, bad fruit. And the good trees, again, only good fruit. Uh, verse 19, every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into fire. Wherefore, by their fruits you shall know them. So then he reiterates in this passage, by your fruits you shall know them, by your fruits you shall know them. Everything in between is talking about the false prophet. That's it. That's what, he, that's what that verse is talking about. And then, of course, it, he continues on. I'm, I'm not going to go through all of it, but and it, it also then gives the explanation, hey, not everyone that says, Lord, Lord, is going to enter in the kingdom of heaven. So don't just think because these false prophets are saying, Lord, Lord, and saying all this stuff that sounds good, that they're saved. By your fruits, you shall know them. And again, it's not the, wor the outward works that they're showing you as their fruit. It's how, do they, how are they re actually reproducing themselves? Because they're not making born-again believers. That's a fruit they can't bring forward. They don't even believe themselves. Turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter 18. Oh, there's so many ways for churches to protect their congregation from the predators. And I think when we have the proper view about who these people are, then maybe churches will stop making so many accommodations for these people to come in and be welcomed and to join their flock. I mean, the church that's, that would openly welcome former pedophiles, I would never go to that church. Amen. Ever. Amen. Ever. Pedophiles can't be fixed. There's no such thing as a former pedophile. It doesn't exist. It exists in the sense that they can say that and try to make people believe that. But that doesn't exist. I mean, even the world will tell you that. Well, I mean, the world these days now is saying all kinds of crazy things, but like, you know, just not that long ago before everything just went ins completely insane, you know, people still knew that. And a lot of people today still will know that and be like, yeah, there's, there's, no, there's no form of treatment. There's no therapy. There's nothing that you can do to stop these people from being reprobate. It's funny because that's what the Bible teaches. <laughs> Imagine that. And specifically when we're talking about the, you know, these predators that would, that would harm little children, I, I, love, I love how Jesus feels about the children. He's got a lot of love for them. He loves the children a lot more than he does the, the predator. Verse number one there in Matthew 18, the Bible says, at the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child unto him and set him in the midst of them. So they're just asking this question about, hey, who's greatest? But in order to illustrate this, he calls a little child, right? Now, look, there's more teaching to this than just what I'm going to focus on. But just, just understand this. There's a little child that he has now standing in front of him. Just right there as his, his illustration, as, as uh, making a point here. And he said, and said, Verily, verily, I say to you, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. So first of all, he talked about being saved, right? Hey, look, 
You need to be like a little child. You need to have that childlike faith in the Lord to save you, right? Because a child has to completely trust on their parents to provide for them. Well, we just have to completely trust on the Lord to save us, right? Like we, we can't, a child's not going to be able to pay the mortgage. A child's not going to be able to go out and, and be able to work and feed themselves and do all this stuff and, you know, and, and just do all the things that are going to be required for them to survive. They need to rely on someone else. So in order for you to be saved, you got to be like a little child and just be like, okay, I'm just going to trust in you, Father. I'm going to trust in you to take care of me. I'm going to trust in you, Lord. So he's giving them that explanation, but then continues on. He says, whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoso shall receive one such little child in my name receiveth me. But then verse number six, he, he continues talking about the little child. But whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Amen. And you know what's funny? He's not saying that that's their judgment. He's saying that's better. <laughs> because the judgment is worse than that. He said it's better for them that they would just have this huge stone wrapped around them and just toss them overboard and that they could just drown and, and stay at the bottom of the sea. That's better than what I got for them. Woe unto the world because of offenses, for it must needs be that offenses come, but woe to that man by whom the offense cometh. Look, that's a fear of God that, that ought to be uh, preached in churches, especially around people like this. And that everyone can, can have the right mindset of going, yeah, these people are really bad. And then he goes on in this passage to talk about hell and, you know, it's better to, to cut off your arm and pluck out your eye than it is to go to hell, which is why it's also better than to just suffer this drowning than it is to go to hell. He's like, I got, I got a much worse punishment for him. And he does. And we need to, we need to, to teach that and it needs to be clear in people's minds. And you know what? That needs to be clear in the minds of the children. God forbid that any child would be on the receiving end of getting abused. But knowing what the Bible teaches about this, hopefully might help them to come forward and say something about it. Because look, these predators screw with kids' heads. Okay, so this isn't just like surefire. If they know this, they'll definitely do it because it, it really messes with their heads. But the more we could just get this emphasized and get people to know, look, this is always wrong. There is no justification for this. I don't care what anyone says and be able to teach the children that and teach the families that and make sure everyone knows that. Uh, if anything were to even start to happen, look, you say something about that. That is never acceptable. That's not okay. I don't care what anyone says. I don't care if it's someone that's working in the ministry and they're saying God said this or God said that. Watch out for that person. You know, when someone just keeps starts coming to you, God told me to do this and God told me to do that. And if they're just saying a bunch of stuff that isn't in Scripture, get away from that person. Because God didn't tell them those things, and they're lying. God said the things that are in this book. God told me that you need to come over, and I'm going to help you. No, 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 no. I mean, they say all kinds of weird things, too, from the documentaries I've seen. Like, you know, God told me that he wants me, you to be my wife and you're going to be my spiritual bride or whatever. Like, all these weird things. Cult leaders and stuff do this stuff a lot. Okay? Teach the red flags. We need to know them. We need to be aware of them. The kids need to know how Jesus feels about you. Jesus wants you protected. And for people who are going to do anything to abuse you like that, he's got, he's got the, the worst punishment for them, for sure. Okay, and it's important to know that because justice will get served. I've got, I've got way too much in my notes. I'm skipping over some stuff. Measures need to be in place at home and at church to prevent the bad things from ever happening. And I'll tell you this much, a background check is not good enough. You know, churches that want to just tout, oh, we've got background checks, we've got background checks. It's not enough. It's not enough. And, you know, again, this is my response as an IFB church to these events that happen. You know, don't lump us in with these pedophile churches, or these predator churches where, where someone has gotten away with it. And you know what? I don't know these churches at all, but, like, Especially if the congregation is saved, you know, like, like, 
you know, I, I would hope they could, you know, learn from that. But, you know, there's a wicked guy that ended up getting in. And, and, and would to God that that wouldn't ever happen again anywhere, but it's going to. But now here's the thing. Learn from this. And, you know, I don't want to learn by experience. I want to learn by other people's experience. Right. And I want to learn by definitely what the word of God says. But what another thing that churches can do to prevent these things from happening is making sure everything is open. If you don't have closed doors to go behind, it's going to be a lot harder for the abuse to take place. But a lot of these places, they'll have these Christian schools and they'll have all these other things going on, or you're meeting up with people at their homes and stuff and say, look, that's as a parent, you don't do that. And look, as a pastor, I'm not going to be having these events where I'm inviting all the kids to my house or something. Right? If kids come to my house, it's going to be for a birthday party, and parents aren't going to be dropping off their kids at my house. They're going to be coming with them. And, you know, I mean, these are the types of things that, look, as parents especially, have the rules for your kids. Don't allow for them. And, and kids might not like it. Okay. You know what they're really not going to like? Getting abused. And I just look at it, the risk isn't worth the reward, right? And, and there's a lot of things you could go into on that. And, and, you know, I'll mention things like when I was a kid, I was allowed to go on sleepovers to other kids' houses, right? I mean, I did it. Nothing ever happened to me. And I'm sure plenty of people do those things and nothing happens to them. But in the event that something were to happen, the risk, and, and because that is, and, and let's face it, that is a great opportunity for a predator to prey on a child, is if that child is taken out of their home, has gone to some other friend's house, and is left alone, if you don't know that that adult's a predator, because you may not, I mean, how many times are people going, I never knew, I never thought, I never thought it'd be so-and-so. Never would have thought it was them. Never thought it was this uncle, this relative, right? This person who is close even in your family. They wear the sheep's clothing, and sometimes they do it really well. And I'm not just saying, like, oh, I'm just always going to spot them. No, I, I mean, you can't trust that, which is why you also have these rules and other things in place in case you don't spot them. Because they are going to be really tricky. They are going to be very sneaky. They are going to be very manipulative and, and not want you to see who they are. And they're going to do everything they can to not be, be show you who they are. But it's an opportunity where you got kids alone. Everyone goes to bed. Predator stays up a little bit late. And now you end up with someone who's been abused and it might not even tell you. Was it worth it? No. Th these are the, I mean, this is the way that we need to be able, unfortunately, these are the ways we've got to view things. And we live in, in a dark place and things are just getting darker. People are getting more wicked. It's getting weirder out there. It's not the same as it was when I was growing up, and it definitely is not the same when my parents were growing up. It's getting worse and worse. But, you know, <laughs> examine that for yourself. And look, the Bible tells us enough to, to show us characteristics, to tell us about these people, and we need to be able to put in common sense uh, uh, rules and restrictions on ourselves. And you know what? You're fundamentalist. You already, people are going to have people tell you, oh, man, you have all these rules and stuff. Yeah, I know. But you know what? I want to safeguard my family. I want to safeguard my marriage. I want to safeguard a church. So it's just the way it is. And even when we, when we started in this church, I started taking doors off of hinges that we didn't need. We've got windows in virtually every room. Now we've done, a, we, since we've done the expansion, I haven't been able to make everything perfect yet. But pretty much everything's just out in the open. All with the goal of not ever having to have, have any of this stuff, you know, happen. The ministries that we do, the, 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 the special events, the things that we do are all public. They're all public. Homeschool field trips, it's public. We're going to a public place, or even if we're coming here, it's all done out here in the open. No one's going off into special classrooms or anything like that. You're going to stay here with the group. Turn, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 5. Now, whether there is a predator that ever creeps into a church or not, it still doesn't change the truth of the Bible. 
And that was one of the things that was like going alongside. So you have all these stories, very emotional stories, and of course they are, tragedies for these women. Like, like I feel terrible that these women had to go through this stuff. I really do. Like, like sincerely, honestly, I, 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 you know, it's, it's, it's a shame that that ever happened. Those people ought to be get, receiving much worse punishments than they have because they're just like in jail. And some of them could just be released still and, and just get out and whatever. It's like, uh, no, that's not what the Bible teaches should happen to them. You know, they deserve a worse punishment than they've received from, from our government, from the law. And, um, and that's, that's a shame. And those, those women ought to be able to receive the proper justice again, you know, for their own healing against the, the predator. But just because that happened does not change what the Word of God teaches. And so what they're trying to say is, well, women are taught to be submissive and women are taught this and that, which is then going to foster this culture of abuse. And, you know, there probably are some IFB churches that have gone overboard on this doctrine of teaching that women should just always be submissive to every man and just do whatever they say, which is, which is weird. You, women don't have to do what every man says. The Bible doesn't teach that. They have a different role in life, right? They have a different role at home, and the Bible outlines those things. But you, a woman is not just under the authority of every single man. The Bible does not teach that. There may be some churches that teach that, but that's wrong, right? Don't follow that doctrine. Make sure your family knows the right doctrine. Make sure your kids know the right doctrine. That No, you don't have to, just, just because you're a woman, you just have to obey every man. But things like husbands and wives, it's a different story. But that's within the family. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22, the Bible says, Wives, submit yourselves on your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Now look, you want to condemn us for believing literally what the Bible says here, then go ahead, be my guest. And if you want to try to condemn God's word because some predator, some false prophet, someone crept in unawares and defiled someone, I mean, that's on you. But we're not associating ourselves with, with that. And thinking people ought to be able to tell the difference between, look, this is what Scripture says and this is right, and whatever happened there is, is wrong no matter what they taught or believed. That's just wrong in every case, but that doesn't mean that their doctrine on wives being a submission to their husbands has anything to do with the abuse. And it's more than just that, and I, and I don't think I'll have time to get into everything, but the, you know, they showed clips where they were talking about women who are dressed immodestly and teaching, preaching against women being dressed immodestly, right? Because when you're not dressed immodestly, what that's going to do, it's going to attract and stir up the lusts of men, right? And the more a man's lust is stirred up, there's a higher likelihood that they're going to try to do something to you. And, and, and why do people ever, I still don't understand why people have such a problem with that teaching. They try to say, oh, you're blaming the victim. We're not blaming the victim. What we're doing is saying, hey, be wise. Because you live in a world and there are facts and there is reality. And there are people out there that if their temptation gets up high enough and if they're lusting after you, you know, and, and, and you, are, you have more of a cause for them to be lusting after you, you're putting yourself in more danger. I'm not saying it's right that anyone would have to do that, but it makes a lot of sense then knowing that these people exist to say, I want to protect my family. I want to protect women in general from being attacked. And it makes sense. Look, this is, these people are out there. And it's not your average everyday person that's a rapist, right? I mean, I, I really would hope that we're not amongst anyone that, that would force a woman, right? I, I don't think so. But, the, you know, people who commit those crimes, they're already twisted in their head. And they're going to they're gonna have a problem with their lust. And I don't want to see my daughters getting abused by someone, some rapist, someone that's going to force them. 
if there was anything I can do to try to help prevent that, that's what I want to do. And if not being an enticement to their eyes is going to help, then I'll do that. But not to mention that the Bible talks about being modest and not drawing attention to yourself. And what are the ways that you draw attention to yourself? Well, one, like the Bible says, is to be wearing the gold, the pearls, the costly array. You can read 1 Peter chapter 3. It talks about that. And the broidered hair, you know, all this fancy stuff, all the glitter, all the things that are going to draw eyes on you. That is literally the exact opposite of modesty. Modesty, humility, means you don't want to be the center of attention. You don't want all eyes on you. But when you, when you put on the things that just draws all the attention, then the eyes are on you. Now, one way, as I mentioned, is the way of putting on all those fancy things. Oh, wow, look at how fancy, look at this part. Look, you know. The other way is to show a lot more skin. Well, men shouldn't be, look. Yeah, they shouldn't be. Men shouldn't look on women to lust after them in their heart. Amen. They shouldn't, but they do. But they do. And women should be dressed modestly. That's what the Bible teaches as well. So when you're drawing the attention, you're drawing the eyes, it's immodest. So the low cut, the high cut on the bottom, you know, all this stuff, just showing all this skin, immodesty. The Bible teaches against it. And that's not, and, and I don't know in what world someone can say, well, see, you're just promoting this culture of, of predators abusing children. What? I want, the, I want my children to be dressed. So they don't get abused. It's like the exact opposite. What, what do you, like, like, where do they come up with this? The problem is that you have people that already have their issues with the church. And they don't like it. So they just want to use that and say, oh, yeah, here's why they're wrong. When these bad things happen and then try to put the two together and when, when they don't go together at all. It, it's funny because I was listening to some other, some other video from people, like every once in a while I'll get some people who like, hey, they, they, they successfully came out of the IFB and all this other stuff, right? Like these videos, like they're in recovery from being in the IFB. And, um, and look, maybe there are some weird churches out there where, like I said, there are these views, but I, like, I've never been in one like that. The IFB churches I've been in have, have all been good. Every single one that I've ever been to and been in and been a part of have been good churches. So it's like, to me, it's really foreign for anyone to have this view of like, oh, I escaped the IFB and uh, now I'm traumatized and now I'm recovering and all this other stuff. It's just like, dude, what's the matter with you? Like, <laughs> it's not, I don't know what churches you've been going to, but the ones I've been going to have been great. So are there, are there rules that you institute in your own life? Yeah. You should, but it's because we're looking at a lot of scripture. In fact, let's keep reading through Ephesians chapter 5 because, I mean, if you want to take issue with oh, women being submissive to their, to their husbands, well, then you're taking issue with Ephesians chapter 5. What does verse 22 say again? Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Wives, submit yourself. I don't have to expound on that. I don't even need to say anything. It makes people angry already. Not necessarily here, I'm just, but you know what I mean. This is like what it says. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. And the other thing I like about this too is this is drawing a comparison between a, a marriage and the church. And going back to independent Fundamental Baptist churches, hey, Christ is the head of this church, not some denomination headquarters. It's funny when people get mad at our church or other churches like ours, and they're like, we need to contact the head of their denomination. You know, it's like, go ahead, just pray to Jesus. He's our head. You got direct, you could have direct access to him. Or get saved at least, you know, <laughs> then maybe he'll hear you, just in case you're not saved, right? And, uh, but that's, that's our head. We don't have any other governing authority. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, 
that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. And um, before I continue, you know, obviously churches, I think, need to have the balanced view of the husband's and the wife's roles, too. And not just always hammering about wives weeks without ever talking about the husbands. Like, look, you need to love your wife. You need to love her the way that Christ loved the church. And how much long suffering and patience does Christ have for his church? For you know, and the love and the selflessness and the you know, to, to allowing himself to be beaten and crucified for the church. You need to love your your wife that way. Look, man, we got we need to teach both. But it's funny, no one ever complains about that. Right? Why not? But look, and, and here's the thing, if it's not being taught, it ought to be. It's getting taught here. But when you see the right balance, it's like, oh, that makes sense. Because then you're going to find that women actually want to serve a man who loves them enough to do anything for them. Kind of go hand in hand. Men, if you're having problems with your wives not really being in submission to you the way they ought to be, love them. <laughs> love them the way Christ loved the church. It might take a little time. It might take a little time. I, I'm serious. I'm serious. Okay, but, but think about this. Sometimes it takes people a little time to get saved. To understand the love that Jesus had for them. And, and Jesus is long-suffering to the unbelievers, too. For a long time, for a while, it shows mercy and long-suffering to the unbelievers and gives them space to repent and to be able to, to put their faith on him. And, and you know, men, let's, you know, don't, don't be bitter against your wives. The Bible teaches that as well. Verse 28, so it men to love their wives as their own bodies. Uh, he that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. We are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery by speaking concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself. And the wife, see that she reverence her husband. Yeah, I'm going to skip over that. All right, let's wrap things up here. Let's turn if you go to Hebrews chapter 13. Because there is another area, I think, specific to what this documentary was talking about to help prevent people in power from abusing their position. Obviously, we need to have certain rules in place. And, you know, even if the church doesn't have those rules, you can have those rules as a family, Right? I would that the, the pastors would be teaching these things to their congregation, but if you do have someone who's wicked, they're not going to be telling you how to, how to not be abused, you know? Why would they want to tell you that? So you always have to be responsible for you and your family, right? And, and you know, before I even continue, because I don't think I have any more notes on this, you know, it, 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 the, the thing that pains my heart the most is when I, when I hear about the abuse and I see these documentaries is how frequently kids don't say anything. Okay, and kids, if you ever, ever find yourself in a position where someone is doing something they shouldn't be, touching you or anything like that, Say something right away, and I don't care who it is, and I don't care how well liked they are by everyone in the church or everyone in your family or whatever. You let someone know about that. And no matter what someone might tell you, because predators are going to try to tell you that you're going to get in trouble or that it's your fault and that you did something wrong and you shouldn't have done that, don't listen to them. The people that do the bad things, they don't care about you at all. They're just going to try to scare you into not saying anything. And parents, have these talks with your kids. Obviously, no one ever wants that to ever even happen, and we should be trying not to have But if it were to happen, it needs to be uncovered right away. The more the abuse goes on, the worse it is, and the more damaging it is. It needs to come to light. Now, we ought to also strive to have a proper balance 
in the church for church authority and for the man of God and never allow that to get out of balance. Okay, Hebrews chapter 13, verse number 7, the Bible reads this, Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. So there's an admonition here. For, for the man of God who has the rule, the, the, the person who's you know, the pastor of the church, the leader of the church, has a rule over the congregation and, and the things of the church. And the Bible's saying, look, follow their faith. The faith that they have, the way that they serve, follow them. That's, that's good. And they have the rule over you, and you ought to submit to that. But that rule, that rule within the church, is not all rule over you and over your life. Amen. It's over how we serve Christ. And that's it. It does not go beyond that. No church leader has the power over anyone else in the church, and it should never be viewed that way. First, jump down to verse number 17. The Bible says, Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls, as they, as they that must give account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. Pray for us, for we trust we have a good conscience in all things, willing to live honestly. So obviously this is talking under the bounds of this having to rule over you. Why? Because they're looking out for you. They're watching for your souls. And someone who's going to try to do evil or any harm like that, they're not looking out for you. They don't care about you. This is assuming that the person is doing good and doing right and living honestly. That's, that's, the, that's why you should respect them and, and everything else. And look, the vast majority of people or I'd be pastors probably are doing good or trying to, you know, living righteously, honestly and stuff like that. And they deserve that respect. But don't ever allow an inordinate affection to be brought forth towards any man. And some in some old IFB churches I've seen that I've seen it unfortunately happen. And you see videos and stuff where people are just kind of going nuts over almost like celebrity status over, over men that preach the word of God. And look, I think it's great to show appreciation. It's, it's wonderful. Like, it's nice. Our church has done nice things for me and my family and has expressed their care for me and for my family. Like, like I, I, that's great. And that's fine when it's all done decently and in order, Right? But it's a whole nother thing when you start treating church like it's a game show or something, and it's like, you know, Pastor So and So, come on down, and you, you know, like, and everyone's like, oh, woo, and it's like going crazy, and you know, it's just like, man, is that really right? I don't know. And look, I don't want to be too nitpicky on some of this stuff, but but there's definitely when when you start when you get to the point of like erecting statues for people, that ain't right. Okay, you've gone you've gone overboard. You start making idols, <laughs> you know, making images, graven images of something that's in heaven, on earth, or in the sea, like the Bible literally said not to do, you, you're gone overboard, you cross the line, okay? So as a church, like, don't let that stuff happen. You know, people, uh, um, like even the Apostle Paul himself was like, he, you know, Satan buffeted him. Right, lest he be exalted above measure. Because what, what he, he received all these revelations and he's, you know, he's delivering the word of God and he's doing all this great work and has a good reason for people to lift him up and look to him and, and maybe even start to idolize him a little bit just because of the work that he's doing. But he, ha he still maintained the right heart of going, hey, you know, I guess I had to be humbled a little bit just to make sure that that he's not going to be lifted up above measure and he's not going to be, you know, in that sense. And, that, you know, we all should just remember that and keep that in mind. And, you know, when, when, when people get lifted up too much, one, it's going it, to, it could potentially make them proud, right, when, when they're inordinately being exalted and lifted up. And it also then has a tendency for people to just more blindly follow and just trust everything more than they should which just gives opportunity for bad things to happen again and it's not that i'm not saying don't trust your pastor or things like that but but don't i mean why why would you ever want to leave your kids alone with someone 
whether they're pastor or not. I don't know. I mean, most of these things, most, I feel can be avoided. There's still going to be evil, and there's still going to be people who do bad things, and we're never going to be able to stop it completely. But, you know, as a church, as a church family, we need to be looking out for this stuff. And, you know, it's, it's a shame that those events happen in other IFB churches. And, um, you know, those ladies deserve d justice and everything else, for sure. But you know what? Not all IFB churches are like those, okay? Definitely not all like that. Do we believe the Word of God? Absolutely. Absolutely. Do we believe in, in gender roles and that men and women have different jobs and God created men and women different? You better believe it. We believe in, in, in all the Word of God. So if you're going to see something like, wow, do you teach this? Well, does the Bible say it? Then we teach it. And I mean, that, that should answer the question right there. So, so the problem isn't really with us. It's with the word of God. Now, you're just perverting the word of God. And it's just your interpretation. Read Ephesians chapter 5. I won't interpret any of it to you. And you just tell me, do you agree with that? Just tell me. For what it says, no explanation can you say, I agree 100% with Ephesians chapter 5? That's what we believe. And if you have to qualify that by saying, well, if you mean by submissive, it means that. It <laughs> now you're the one interpreting. Because I'm just saying, read it for what it says. We understand English here. You know, there's, there's, the, the Bible teaches us that the natural man receiveth not the things of God, and that's absolutely true, 100%, amen, right? But you have to admit that there's definitely some, some aspects of Scripture that unsaved people can still understand. For example, thou shalt not kill. Like, an unsaved person can understand that commandment and know, like, you're not supposed to kill people. And while the, an unsaved person may not be able to get all of the deep meanings of Ephesians chapter 5, the service meaning is pretty simple. You know what I'm saying? Right, like just that service level. I, look, folks, it says what it says. And if, you, and if you hate that, then you've got a problem with God, not with an IFB church. Turn if you to Luke chapter 6. I'm just going to close on this. Man, all right, it's overtime already. Just understand this once more, too. And, and again, I, I know I'm preaching this kind of in regard in, in response to this to this video I saw this documentary. But this one point for sure is not has nothing to do with those other churches that were uh, because I don't know them at all, right? So I don't I don't want this point to necessarily be applied to them because I don't know anything about them. Honestly, I, I have no idea who the churches are. I didn't do any research in them, looking at anything like that. So maybe they were good churches, maybe they weren't, I don't know. Obviously the men that abused people were bad, but maybe the churches were good. And the reason why I even say that is just to bring this up because just remember also that the churches who are doing the most for God will also be the highest targeted churches. So you want to talk about people wanting to creep in and destroy churches? Well, the more good work that a church is doing, the higher the likelihood that Satan is going to try to destroy that church. So it's going to cause more problems, and it's all the more reason to be protective over your families and to be able to watch out for this stuff. Now, maybe that was the case at these churches. Maybe not. I don't know. I don't know. But it's a fact that when you, that like the Bible said, yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution, that's a fact. And also, look at Luke 6, verse 22, the Bible says, blessed are ye when men shall hate you and when they shall separate you from their company and shall reproach you and cast out your name as evil for the son of man's sake. Rejoice ye in that day and leap for joy for behold, your reward is great in heaven for in like manner did their fathers unto the prophets. But woe unto you that are rich for ye have received your consolation. Woe unto you that are full for ye shall hunger. Woe unto you that laugh now for ye shall mourn and weep. And then look at verse 26. Woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you, for so did their fathers to the false prophets. We're looking at different signs of false prophets and, and the fruit that they bear and looking at their characteristics. Well, here's one more thing, which is interesting. The false prophets 
are usually well loved by the world. When all men are speaking well, Jesus said, <laughs> you know what? That's what the fathers that persecuted the men of God, they did the same thing to the false prophets. They honored them, they revered them, they loved them. They hated the things of God, they loved the false prophets. So just be aware that true Christianity, like the ones that follow Christ, like the, what Christ is talking about here, is not going to be loved by the world. A true prophet, someone who is like the prophets of old, someone who's standing on the word of God and is preaching, thus saith the Lord, and is truly, sincerely preaching all the counsel of God's word, is not going to be loved by the world. For if you're looking for a church to attend and you find one, hey, everybody loves this church. Even the Catholics love this church, the Hindus love this church, the Muslims love this church. The, 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 this church is going on the news and being promoted on this. You know, it's like, probably not the church you want to go to. If the whole world loves it, there's a problem there. Because that's how false prophets are received. And it's, and, you know, it's definitely no surprise when you see the mega churches with all their scandals and stuff. When they're these loved by the world, loved by everybody, loved by the, you know, just, oh, what a great, you know, like, oh. Red flag. Because what Jesus said, a true sign of, of someone who's blessed and someone who's doing right is people are separating you from their company and reproaching you and casting out your name as evil because of, he said, for the son of man's sake, meaning they're teaching and preaching Jesus and they're teaching and preaching the things of God. And when people just say, no, I don't like, you know, I'm, I want to separate from you. That's a sign you're doing the right thing. Because Jesus is saying, hey, be happy about that and rejoice because you're going to get a lot of rewards for that. <laughs> Suffering for the cause of Christ. So. It's unfortunate, you know, you want to, people want to slam IFB churches for whatever reason, and then it, what would be really unfortunate is then going to a church that's just loved by the world, and then getting yourself in the mix now of another false prophet somewhere that's just going to be able to abuse more people. No, if you're looking for a good church, find one that the world hates, right? And, but, but more importantly, more importantly, find someone who's just teaching all the counsel of God. Right? Take care of your family. Take care of your children. Be aware of any instance where your children might be in danger of something happening because they're outside of your control. Make sure you at least know what's going on, where they're going to be, and keep those doors of communication open. I would never want to see this happen anywhere. Unfortunately, offenses must come. You know, woe unto them to whom the offenses come. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for all the warnings that you give us in Scripture about, about the evil people in this world. I pray that you please protect our church, protect our families, dear Lord, protect our little children that you love so much. And uh, Lord, help us to be good parents. Help us to be vigilant. Help us to be diligent in the education of the children. I pray that you would please help me to have my eyes open over the things and the affairs of this church that uh, there wouldn't be any opportunity for anything wicked or bad to happen here, dear Lord. Um, we love you and we thank you so much for, for all that you give us, dear Lord, and especially for this wisdom and instruction that you, you provide for us through your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.